Once more, friends, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor here. And today we are continuing a series we started last week entitled Ranking Christmas. Now, really, we're ranking the Christmas characters. And last week, we started out by looking at the supporting cast. And we said that we were going to rank those four characters, but the real big takeaway from last week was this idea that God wants to bless others through us. And we have the opportunity to support people, right? We can bless or curse with how we respond and with what we say. Now, if you missed that message and you want to get caught up, that can be found right on our YouTube channel. But this week, we're going to move forward. We're going to be talking about the antagonists. And I kind of wanted to call them the evil people, but it turns out not all antagonists are evil. Sometimes an antagonist is just somebody who's ambivalent or somebody who's just not willing to make enough space or enough room for someone else. But before we get into that, I want to set the scene for you. I was a sophomore in college at the excellent Houghton College. Any Houghton people? Yeah, let's go. So, the excellent Houghton College. I was a sophomore there. I was in the exact same room I spent my freshman year in. And I had the exact same roommate I had my freshman year. But the floor was filled with a whole bunch of new guys. Totally different people. And so we did a lot of floor bonding activities. Things like jumping off of bridges into creeks and helmets and gloves. That's where you put on lacrosse helmets and lacrosse gloves and you fight. That's a bonding activity. Uh, We also went out and did fun activities like going to the movies. And that brings me to the first question I have for all of you today. Now, this is simple. This is a show of hands for in-person people. Online people, you're just going to comment a yes or a no down below. But the question is, have you ever been to a drive-in movie before? Show of hands. Yeah, so online people, it's a little hard for me to see. But I'm going to say that it's like 75% of the room has been to a drive-in, and I'm guessing 5 or 10% of people are like, I just don't want to raise my hand. I don't care. You could ask me if I breathe air, and I'm still going to like this. Um, So we went to a drive-in movie, and the movie was Black Hawk Down. It was like a perennial, like early 2000s action movie, war movie. It was a really exciting opportunity for all of us to go to this movie. We were all like super jazzed up about the movie. And we all felt like we should do it. It was like this important thing. The downside of going to a drive-in theater with a bunch of college guys, many of whom were freshmen, was not many of us had cars. We did not have very many vehicles. And what this meant was we went in just a few cars with a lot of guys. So we had guys in the front of cars. We had guys in the back of cars. We had guys on the floor of cars. We even had some guys in the trunks of cars. Now, you heard me say the, the reason that we told our parents why we did this because there were just not that many cars. But it also may have turned out that this particular drive-in theater charged per axle. Per axle, that's right. So if you had 12 guys in a car, you still paid the same price if you had two guys in a car. And that made the drive-in theater a little bit more economically uh, affordable for us. Uh, But the other thing was, again, this was like important, and so everyone went. Not everyone did helmets and gloves and beat each other up in the dorm. And not everyone jumped off a bridge into an unknown depth body of water. But everyone went to watch Black Hawk Down because it was important. And so what we did was we just kind of crammed guys in left and right. It literally had to look like a clown car when we were all coming out of the cars and setting up our little folding chairs all around the the drive-in theater uh, area. Um, It was important. It mattered. And so we made the space. We made the room. Today, as we are going to talk about the antagonists of the Christmas story, and there are three of them, we're going to point out the reality that one of these characters is downright evil. One of these characters is ambivalent, just didn't care, couldn't care, didn't matter. But one of these characters probably wasn't ambivalent or evil. They probably were good. They just didn't make the necessary space. They were unwilling or unable to make room. And that makes them an antagonist, a a negative character in the story. To help us talk about that, we're going to use a passage of Scripture in your Bibles that comes from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Now, Luke 2, 1 to 7 is like, I don't know, I want to say like four-fifths of the way through your Bible. Uh, It's in a part called the New Testament. Luke is the third of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, And if you brought your Bible from home like I did, we're going to turn the lights on for you so you can go ahead and follow along. Now, if you didn't, don't worry in person, folks. You can just totally look on the screen. We'll put it 
You can totally look on the screen. We'll put it right up behind me. I was really worried the screen had turned off and I was telling you to look. So uh, it's important to understand here just a couple things. This story was initiated by a census. If you're not familiar with a census, it's because you don't get mail in the United States. But censuses are where they try to find out who lives in a region or a country. And spoiler alert, your Bible thinks censuses are bad because historically censuses are used to tax people. They're trying to find out how many people so they can know how much money to get. And this census was initiated by Rome. See, this is a period of time when Israel is not its own country or it doesn't govern itself. It's actually underneath the leadership and the governance of Rome. And so Rome does this and then Israel's leaders implement it. And that's where we're picking up our story today. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This is the word of God. It's given freely to each and every one of you. So let's go back to verse 1. If we look at verse 1, we're told, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And here is where we are, going to, uh, we are going to meet our very first antagonist, and that is Caesar Augustus. Now, it turns out Caesar, uh, I, think, I think we have a little graphic of him. There we go, Caesar. And you can see that little picture of him. Online people, you can't. In person people, you can totally see that little picture. It's, it's like this big in your eyes, right? We got this picture of Caesar. He was actually a really, really important guy. It turns out the reason why all the Roman rulers after him were referred to as Caesar was because of Augustus Caesar. Right? He was the second of the Caesars, but he was the one that ended the republic. There was no longer a republic, it was him. And he was a big deal. It's also the reason why there's this month in the summer called August. It's because of Augustus Caesar. Perhaps you've heard of this thing called Pax Romana, which meant Roman peace. It was when Rome was in charge, the world was largely at peace. The other thing they called that Pax Romana sometimes was Pax Augustus because under Caesar Augustus, that peace began. So he was important. But Caesar is the reason why there's the census in Jerusalem and in Israel because he decided we got to make sure we're getting our fair share from these people. Let's, let's do a, a, a census. Now, he wasn't necessarily bad for this reason, at least. He wasn't necessarily bad because of this, but he just didn't care. He didn't care one way or the other. He just wanted his fair share, right? He wanted his money from that little backwater uh, region and those people. And so he becomes the very first antagonist in the biblical story. We wouldn't have Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem if not for Caesar Augustus. Now, I have to mention the second antagonist right here and now. And this person is not in our story from Luke. This person can be found in Matthew's gospel. His name was King Herod. Sometimes he was referred to as Herod the Great. And Herod had a bunch of kids that then ruled after him. But Herod the Great was the opposite of great. He is flat out evil. He's the one in Matthew's gospel who kills all of the baby boys in and around the Bethlehem area from the age of three to birth because the wise men came and told him they saw a star and it herald, heralded the birth of a king. And King Herod was so upset with this and so worried about losing his power that he sent soldiers to kill babies and toddlers. That's pretty terrible. A pretty awful guy. He's our second antagonist, and this is a reminder that you can be an antagonist whether you're just kind of ambivalent, like meh, or you're flat out evil. Either way, is bad stuff. Now, I want to keep moving on in our story, though, and move on to Luke chapter 2, verse 4. If we go to Luke 2, verse 4, we get into the beginnings of what we call the Christmas story, right? Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Galilee is like a region, an area. It's in the northern part of the country, uh, from your perspective, northern part on this side. And then he went 
into Bethlehem, into the town of David. Now, he's actually going down, but they're moving upwards. Uh, and so he goes into Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. This is really important to understand here that Bethlehem was seen as the city of David. When David was in charge, Bethlehem was a big deal. And there came to be this expectation among the Jewish people that the Messiah, the one who would save them from Roman rule, would end up coming from Bethlehem. But by the time this story is being told, Bethlehem is kind of like an ordinary town filled with ordinary people. It's not special. It's not the capital of the city, right? That, that King Herod, he had rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem in, the, in, in what was the capital. And so Bethlehem was just kind of a place. But this is a reminder that often we find God in the ordinary. It's oftentimes in the ordinary and the mundane, the regular and the routine in our lives that we encounter God, if we're looking. Let's continue moving on, though, to verse 7, because this is the important part for our story today. In verse 7, we're told that Mary has given birth in Bethlehem, and she wrapped her son in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them or no guest room available. I want to break this down just a tiny bit because there's a couple things going on here. The first one is that word manger. As a kid, at least, in my mind, I always envisioned manger meant crib or bassinet or pack and play or whatever word you use for it. That's what I thought manger was. I was not a smart child, right? Manger is a feeding trough. It's the thing the animals eat out of. And that's what they placed little baby Jesus in was a feeding trough. Now, I've read some biblical commentators who said, this was excellent. This was an excellent thing. It was like the perfect size and kept the baby secure. And I have to be honest, if you came to me and said, oh, Pastor John, I've got the greatest thing. I've been putting my newborn baby in an animal feeding trough. It's just perfect. It's so great. I let him play around in there. I, I mean, I'm not a mandatory reporter, but I might report you. I might think like, what is wrong here? It is not excellent. It's less than excellent. But then I want to take us to this idea of guest room. Now, you may have a Bible or have read a Bible or heard a story that talks about no room for them at the inn. And the NIV, the translation we use here, is trying to help us understand better by calling it a guest room because the reality is there are multiple, uh, multiple words for, the, for, the, for the, the thing called an inn, like a tavern or a hotel, a motel, right? a place where people go to stay. And the word that's used here in your Bible is not the normal word used for like a hotel, for an inn, a, a lodging place. Rather, it's a common word used for an extra room, a guest room. And it's more likely that that's actually what was going on. And I have to be honest, I went through four years of undergraduate and three years of master level and never was taught this. And then I went to Israel on a tour and my tour guide, who was like educated to like third grade, was like, oh yeah, that... That's not true. This is what they're talking about. And what he pointed out to me when we were in the city of Bethlehem and we were hanging out in what they believed to be Joseph's workshop was that this is how the people lived. They lived in like a cave. And when we're talking about a guest room, we're talking about a separate space in the cave. Now, it was really common at that time for people to cohabitate with their animals. This makes a lot of sense because your animals help warm up the cave when it's cold. It doesn't make as much sense because your animals also sometimes aren't house trained, right? If you get a puppy or a kitten, you know that even the, the domesticated ones don't always go where they're supposed to. But what's going on here is Mary is being, uh, having Jesus in a guest room, in an extra room. And yeah, this is where the animals hang out, but it's not out in a barn like we're thinking. So maybe better, maybe worse. The point is, is that here we're being introduced to our third antagonist, right? And again, this is a reminder that antagonists don't have to be evil. And they don't even have to be neutral. Sometimes they can be good and just not doing the right thing. See, if we go back to that Luke chapter 2 verse 7 passage, there was no guest room available. Now, you'll notice there's no naming of an innkeeper, and yet, oftentimes when we talk about the Christmas story, we mention an innkeeper as, a, as if they're a character. And this third antagonist for us here today is a person who is, I think, intentionally vague, intentionally not specific about who they are. And partly, it's likely because who it was was Joseph's family. 
Remember, he went back to Bethlehem because that's where his family was from. That was where his line was from. He's probably staying with his aunt or his uncle or his great aunt or his great uncle. And so this is the in-laws that are saying to Mary, hey, the best we can do is where the animals hang out. That's the spot for you to give birth. Now, I don't want to be too hard on them, but I have to think that if you came to my house and you were giving birth or your spouse was giving birth, I would like to think that if I didn't have very many spaces, I would give you my space and I would go to where the animals are, not send the pregnant lady to where the animals are. And this brings us to this really important point that this person, they're an antagonist because they just didn't make room. They didn't make space. They said, well, this is the best we can do. And it makes them kind of a, a villain character in this story. Who would send a pregnant woman giving birth where the animals are and say, that's, that's it. And the manger, that's the best we got. Good luck. Let's look at this from a different perspective. Because I think the innkeeper is purposely vague because you and I are guilty of being the innkeeper sometimes in our lives. You and I are guilty of not making room, of not making space, either because we are unwilling or because we are unable or because we just don't think about it. And so the question I want to ask you for our second question is simply this, what takes up too much space in your life? What is it that is filling your life so much that you are unable or unwilling or don't even consider making space for Jesus? This can be a lot of things. This can be like food. Food is so important to me. I just can't. I got to, you know, you're constantly thinking about and acting on food. Or maybe this is something really good like work. Like work is just takes up too much space. Maybe it's some kind of activity or hobby that you really love. It brings you joy, but it takes up too much space. Or maybe it's some kind of platform. That would be things like Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. I don't know what it is for you, right? Maybe it's a device. Maybe it's a person. Take a second. Think about that. And then in person, people, Share with somebody around you, online people, just comment down below, what is it that's taking up too much space in your life? Go ahead and do that now if you would. So online people, I gotta let you know that the room was really mixed. A lot of times when I ask a question like this, the room will just be quiet and everyone will stare at me and they'll be like, this isn't fair. I, I needed to know about this last night. But today, what we had immediately was three or four people around the room immediately knew. It was like they were convicted in the moment, and they could tell you. And then the rest of the room looked at me awkwardly and at those three or four people, like, how can you possibly know the answer to this so quickly? Uh, this is definitely a question that may take some time to consider. Uh, I took a little bit of time, and this is the answer I'm going to give you. See, for me, it would be really easy to say it's like my phone or my TV, my job, or to point at something or somewhere and say, that's what's taking up too much space in my life. But the reality is that I think that's a little bit like cheating. Because the truth of the matter is, what takes up too much space in my life is not a what, it's a who, and it's me. I take up too much space in my own life. Too much of my life is about me, right? Too many things I do are because I need them or I want them, right? I, I need a little me time. I need a little time to unwind, to relax, to take it easy. Let me give you a very specific and very recent for instance. Last night, right? Yesterday was a busy day in the Martin household. We had things going on here at the church. We had things going on in Corning. I was ramming all over the place. By the way, I drove all the way to Corning, like, like 10 minutes outside of Corning, to find out that the thing I thought was happening there was, was done happening there, and it was time for me to turn around and drive all the way back to Vestal. It was exciting, right? <laughs> Glorious. What this meant was last night at something like 9.30 or 10 o'clock after my children were sent to their beds, I said, I just need some time for me. And so I sat on my couch and I turned on my TV and I said, I just need some mindless nonsense. And I pulled out my phone and I was like, yeah, I'm going to play some game too because I can't possibly do only one task. I need like two or three because I have a really bad attention span. And the next thing I knew, I had woken up with my AirPod in my ear, but not connected to my phone any, or to my TV anymore, and my TV blaring at me really loud. And it was the middle of the night. I had fallen asleep on the couch. 
Now, I did not get up at that point. I just turned the TV volume down. I took the earpod out of my ear and continued to lay on the couch. I woke up three or four more times. What does this mean? This means that later today, I'm going to go home from church and I'm going to say, I need some me time. I'm really tired. I didn't sleep well last night. And I'm going to sit on that couch and I'm probably going to fall asleep again. And I'm going to wake up multiple times. Now, the solution to all of this would be to say, I need to go to bed in my bed and sleep through the night, right? Maybe the me time can be we time with my wife. But instead, I was like, it's all about me, baby. I need my time. Now, this may resonate with you, or you may be like, that guy is bad, and I would never do that. I don't know, but I do know that there are things, probably multiple, in your life that are taking up too much space. And one of the reasons why we focus in on these kinds of themes during the Christmas season, or some churches call it the Advent season, is because we're trying to prepare the way for Jesus to enter into our lives more. We don't want to be like the innkeeper who says, best I can do is the room the animals hang out with. We want to be better. We want to make space for Jesus. The reality is that we want to remove something or some things to make room. Now again, we're going to continue this series of ranking Christmas. And we're looking at different characters, the Christmas story, in the goal of learning from them. Sometimes we're inspired by them like last week. The, the ones who supported, we want to be like them. The ones like this week, who did the wrong thing. We want to be better. We want to do something different from them. Again, today we talked about the antagonists, right? And we realize they're not always bad. Sometimes they're just ambivalent. Sometimes they just don't think about it or just can't or aren't willing to make space. But if you remember nothing else from today, if you don't remember that in college I was a fool and rode in a car in a trunk with a bunch of other teenage boys, and if you don't remember that sometimes I fall asleep on the couch because I just need me time, what I want you to remember is this idea that we need to make room for Jesus today. Pray with me if you would. God, help us not to put off what can be done today until another day. Help us to make room for you so that we might hear you, see you, experience your presence and your power in our lives in new and fuller ways so that we can be blessed and in turn bless others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.